Welcome to Iron and Ceramite, Librarius Omnis, where we explore the depths of the Black Library. Hello everyone, welcome to Iron and Ceramite and uh, our latest edition of a Librarius Omnis. Um, we're finishing off Fulgrim today, so we're up to part five. Um, it's, it's been a, a long journey for those of you that have been listening along. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of content to go through with Fulgrim. Um, yes, it's it's one book. Um, it's in five parts and each part has lots and lots to unpack. So if this is your first video with us uh, or first you found us um, and this is the first video you come from, we'd obviously recommend you go back and listen to parts one through four so that you don't get any spoiler alerts and, and you kind of understand what's happening. Um, obviously, there are spoiler alerts here if you if you haven't read the book. <laughs> Um, because we do go into it in some quite detail. Um, a quick recap, and every time I do these quick recaps, they take a little bit longer. So this is going to be a real top-line recap, um, if I can remember it all. So part <laughs> one, uh, Fulgrim, the Emperor's Children, they fight against the Laren uh, on... I oh, know, the Lair on the planet Laren. Fulgrim discovers a, um, uh, a sword in the temple in the final battle, um, and we're also introduced to a load of remembrances, all from uh, artistic uh, sides. So uh, sculptors, painters, singers, composers, poets, stuff like that. So it's setting the uh, the Emperor's Children up for one of those legions that uh, is seeking perfection, but perfection in all things. And there's a very high possibility that the uh, the temple on uh, Laren, there were things going on there that Astartes had not seen before. Um, we then move into book two, where we meet uh, Ferris Manus and the Iron Hands, and we get an understanding of the relationship between not only Fulgrim and Ferris, but also uh, between the Iron Hands and the Emperor's children generally. Um, and they help out a little bit in um, catching some uh, some wayward uh, Xenos, or, or when I say Xenos, a kind of Xenos um, human split, where uh, they're, they're not going to join the fold. Um, and that's good enough for them to be wiped out. And so um, Fulgrim helps Ferris Manus uh, persecute the uh, the war against the uh, Disparex. Um, and after successfully doing that, Fulgrim gets back to crusading uh, with the rest of with the rest of the Emperor's children, and they come into uh, an area called the Something Anomaly. Um, I can't remember the first part of it. We took we took ages on part three to find this. Perjudice. Could be, something like, could be. It's something definitely like something anomaly, and not paradox. <laughs> so that's that's a callback to episode three. But anyway, they get they get there and um, they find that actually it's a load of uh, what's called Eldari maiden worlds. Um, Eldari, obviously being the uh, the copyrighted version of Eldar, um, but they're they're Eldar. That's that's effectively what it is. Um, and what happens is they eventually meet. Um, Eldrad Ulfran, uh, the far seer of Craftworld Ulfway, who tries to warn um, Fulgrim of what's going to happen and what's happening with Horus. Um, Fulgrim is not happy about this um, and uh, powered up by his his sword that he discovered on the uh, the temple on Lair. Um, there's a bit of a bit of a fight that kicks off between um, the Eldar, the Eldari, and the Astartes. It's a pretty good fight. Um, Fulgrim takes down uh, an avatar of Cain, gets a bit injured in doing so, but at the same time gets out and, and keeps going. Um, and so it's a really good fight. And obviously at this point, he's aware um, that maybe things are not all they seem with the Lunar Wolves and with Horus. Following this, um, we then get a bit of a, uh, bit of a break where um, one of the uh, High Lords, oh, it's not High Lord of Terror, but he's, he's high up in the Administratum of Terror. Is it? Um, to come and talk to, to Fulgrim, let him know about the rumours and maybe things aren't happening the way they should do in the Lunar Wolves. Um, obviously, Fulgrim decides he's going to go and see his brother Horus and just check things out. Um, and also, maybe, uh, sate his curiosity as to what Eldrad talked about. Um, he gets there. As I said, I'm trying to keep this short. He gets there. <laughs> uh, Horus tells him, no, I have fallen for chaos. Not in those words. Um, Fulgrim it's like, okay, cool, I'll join you. Um, but first of all, why don't I try and go and get Ferris to join us as well? I think I can convince him. Horace says, all right, off you go. 
Um, you know, I could do with the iron hands. Otherwise, I'll have to get the iron fists, um, which he does have to do in the end. That's a side note. But anyway, he goes off to go get the iron hands and Ferris. Um, meanwhile, Horace continues his war um, and setting up um, what's going to happen at Isfan 3. Um, fast forward, Fulgrim's uh, killing a few orcs, meets up with Ferris, tells him what's what. Ferris is not happy. They have a fight. Fulgrim can't bring himself to kill him. Uh, but does still kill a load of people in, or kill a load of the uh, the the bodyguard, the Morlocks uh, of mm. the Iron Hands. Um, skips out of town, heads to Istvan Free. Um, whilst we're on that, that you know, we we get another look at what's happening on Istvan Free and the really sad demise of uh, one of the the, the the characters of the book, Solomon uh, Demeter, who mm. unfortunately is laid low by uh, our good friend uh, Lucius. Um, and then we we finally get the part where um, Fulgrim tells Horace that he couldn't uh, turn Ferris. Um, Horace is obviously not best pleased, um, but um, manages to speak to um, Fulgrim's ego and convince mm-hmm. him to go off and set up Istvan Five uh, for what is going to go on to be become the drop site massacre. And that's where we're up to. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I missed anything there, John. No, it doesn't matter. And if you did miss it, there's four videos. Go back and, and watch them. Oh, uh, and of course, in my introduction, I, it was terrible. I'm also joined today by John. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> I've been here the whole time. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I think you've uh, pretty much covered it. You don't need to. If you was going to cover it in any detail, we'd be here for the full seven hours. So. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. Every every time we've done one of those recaps, <laughs> they get longer. It's like, how can I keep this? How can I keep this as uh, as, as quick as possible? But it's, uh... why, why why do you think I haven't offered to do it? Yeah, no, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but you do bring us nicely into part five, the last phoenix. Mm-hmm. Um, Chapter 21, the events of Vistavan 3 are done and dusted. Um, we find out now Ferris Manus has survived the wounds caused to him by Fulgrim and he is pissed off. Mm-hmm. Um, he, by now, his fleet is mostly repaired um, and recovered. Um, they're slowly limping their way back to Terra. Um, they can't use the warp. Um, because the astropaths have not been able to find a clear route through the storms uh, yeah. and many have died trying as we found out um, a long time ago when Horus um, made a pact with uh, a demon um, Sakar or Scar mm-hmm. or something like that yeah. um, he um, told Horus we're in charge of the warp anybody who's not on your side ain't getting through yeah. uh, make it difficult um, and we've seen that obviously in Flight of the Eisenstein as well. Um, <clears throat> Santar, who got power clawed in the chest and ripped down through the groin, yep. he's still he's still alive. Um, and he has had most of his body replaced with uh, robotics. So he's, a, uh, he's actually quite happy for the Iron Hands. That's that's all right. He's uh, that's it's a plus. That's good. Um, he didn't survive on anything other than a sheer will to wreak revenge on Julius. So yeah, he's not um, happy about it. There's some angry, angry men on this ship. Yeah. Um, they've heard all the rumors coming in that all over the galaxy, traitors are turning on loyalists. War is breaking out. Um, loyalist planets are being attacked by traitors, hit left, right, mm-hmm. and center. Um, that's leaving um, other places open for rebellion and Xenos forces the orcs in particular um are loving it and they're getting in and amongst it um and they've also found out that the forges of mars are now in rebellion uh and there's a war going off there um santa and their chief navigator um bring news to ferris manis that dawn is assembling a force Mm -hmm. um to deal with horus um obviously dawn is either heading back or uh, or back at terror by now um and he has picked some loyalist uh legions to take the fight to istavan um included are the salamanders the alpha legion the iron warriors mm-hmm. the word bearers the raven guard and the night lords um yes. 
I don't know much about most of these. Um, salamanders, I know from Hell's Reach. Um, they're they make a uh, cameo in that. Yeah, Primarchs Vulcan. Um, they love a bit of uh, Prometheum, so they like yeah. uh, they like purging with fire. Yeah, I've read Legion, but I still don't know much about the Alpha Legion. No um, one does. I, Who are they? Various. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, two Primarchs um, shrouded in mystery. Um, I, you know, as I said, it, it's an interesting one. Like, we're not going to, we won't go into the Alpha Legion entirely here, but yeah, no, no they're, they're, they're the last ones, you know, to be united with their, their Primarchs, in this case, two Primarchs. Mm. Um, and they are a Legion that uses subterfuge and mystery. Mm. Um, and we look forward to doing Legion, and I also look forward to learning more about them. Uh, Iron Warriors, I don't know anything about the Iron Warriors. Iron Warriors, led by uh, Perturabu, are the Perturabo, who are the um, equivalent of the Imperial Fists. So okay. the Imperial Fists are um, siege breakers. Um, and and they're, 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 you know, one of the reasons they were uh, chosen as the um, uh, to go back to Terra is to make ready the defences because um, they specialise in siege warfare as do the Iron Warriors. So Iron Within, Iron Without. They mm -hmm. are the equivalent of um, the Imperial Fists, but uh, Perturabu maybe doesn't see that he gets the same uh, level of like respect and honour that Dawn does. But they are effectively the equivalents of um, the Imperial Fists, the other way around. So they specialise in Siege Warfare as well. Cool. Uh, we get our good friend Erebus is chapter or legion, sorry, the word bearers, um, yep. religious fanatics who, are, from memory, got in trouble for trying to spread the word of the emperor as a god. Yeah, that's um, it. And then that, got pushed. They got told off uh, for basically, so the, the book, the original book of Lorgar was effectively the, um, uh, what's it called, the Lictitious divinatus was effectively that that was what he was okay. preaching um that the emperor is is a god um and that's why they they got told off because effectively it took them a lot longer to make worlds compliant because mm. rather than just making them compliant they would then indoctrinate them with with this faith okay um and then got told off so he's obviously ripped a few pages out and changed some of the words they got to... they got they got admo yeah they got admonished for it um yeah. and uh, humiliated and um okay the the ultramarines uh came down and, and basically well i, I won't spoil it because it comes yeah. up in, in one of the other books but oh, effectively okay. they got they got really told off and lorgar okay. was like well if he doesn't want me to worship him as a god there are other gods and maybe they were the right ones oh wow um cool so we have then the raven guard again i know nothing about the raven guard chorus corva Cor yeah chorus corvax uh primarch um they're all about um like lightning speed attacks so whether that be through uh jump packs or bikes um but they are yeah they're all about speed and and um sort of um lightning attacks so uh, hit and run cool uh, and finally the night lords again i know nothing yeah the night lords are a bit of a bit of a dark one so conrad kurz the the night mm. the night haunter um and, and basically they're, they're, they're the reason like every primarch has got something they did on their planet right that that caught the eye and made that and yeah conrad got rid of like all crime on his planet um which is a planet that had perpetual night, um, but he got rid of it by just killing everyone. Um, <laughs> so it's a bit extreme, but yeah, he's he's a bad dude. And uh, obviously, yeah, you know, you could you could could argue it's probably not far off, but he's uh, yeah, he he basically his his the idea between uh, the, or the night lords and the night haunter is that it's their terror troops. So. Oh. Um, the enemy is, is going to be much much less able to defend themselves if they're also terrified. So their tactics are all based on terror and extreme action to spark terror. Cool. Awesome. Um, and I look forward to actually getting to some of those yeah, uh, you'll, you'll legions get, as we go. Get to, get to <laughs> awesome. Um, so 
the war master has been denounced by the emperor and mm -hmm. dawn is now the emperor's champion yeah um he has stated that the em iron hands should rendezvous with a full force um of their legion um with the others um however ferris manis um wants to just get there he wants to get there restore his honor kill fulgrim um and he orders all of his remaining Morlocks to transfer to the Therum of Captain Bao, uh, who we met earlier in this in the in this series, mm -hmm. um, as that's the fastest ship. Uh, and the rest of the Legion that's still limping is to make their way and get there as and when they can. Um, with uh, back on the, the um, Pride of the Emperor, Ostian has finally finished um, his statue. Um, he is done, happy with it, perfect. He's put his tools down. He is just waiting for this uh, expedition to be over. It's all gone to pot. This hasn't been the holiday he wanted. Um, <laughs> and he wants to go home. Um, he uh, has been there for months now at this point. Yeah. Uh, hasn't been wandering around because the last look he got was Serena um, in a bit of a state. Le Fenis was, uh, or Le Fenice was Le in Fenice. a horrible state, yeah. um, and he left there. So he thinks, now it's time to reintroduce myself to the world. I'm going to go out and have a wander around. And as he turns around, Fulgrim is stood behind him, uh, watching him. Um, and obviously his last meeting with Fulgrim, he actually insulted him um, yeah. and gave some bad feedback. <laughs> and... Uh, Fulgrim sees that um, this statue that we haven't known what he was making this whole time yeah. um, is now the emperor and Fulgrim just starts talking and says he remembers when the emperor used to look that way yeah. um, and remembers how perfect this is and then he compares Ostian to the emperor in some ways telling him that it's not fair that Ostian told me that my sculpts were too perfect to be beautiful but then you've created a perfect statue of the emperor. Um, um, call him back to previous conversation. Yep. Um, he tells him that if he hadn't been so selfish and locked himself away, um, he would have seen what was happening within the Legion. And yep. he wouldn't have made this statue. He would have smashed its pieces and he would have started again and created a statue of uh, Fulgrim. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly by this point, the madness is in Fulgrim's eyes because as he's closing in, he um, manages to cause Ostian to piss his pants. So that's two for two. Um, uh, I don't know. There's one point, there's a description of Fulgrim, and I don't know whether it's at this point or whether it's earlier on. I think it might have been earlier on, but I forgot to mention it. Is where someone describes him as looking like um, almost like a, like a pantomime dame where he's got like makeup caked on now. Yeah, like I think. It's mentioned a couple of, I, I, I think that's one thing we haven't touched on because there's a few times where it starts off really uh, minute where people are like, oh, he's wearing a bit of makeup. And then yeah. like you say, he is now, he looks like something that you would see in a, in a bad pantomime, yeah. like too much makeup. Um, Grease paint all over his face. Yeah. Um, and he's even started like tattooing and like clear tattoos, if you know what yeah. I mean. Um, skin tone tattoos um, yeah so he um, scares the piss out of Ossian backs him up against the statue and as Ossian stood there in fear um, Fulgrim starts circling him and just flat out tells him the plans of Istvan 5 tells him what's happened on Istvan 3 yeah. um, Ossian can just see something going on behind Fulgrim's eyes um, as he's walking around and then Fulgrim plunges his sword through the back of the statue which bursts out of Ostian's chest yeah. and kills him um, which uh, again like another remembrance of down um, another main character down um, he was quite a, a key, although he didn't do anything he was quite a key character bringing us to this point yeah, I think that was it. I think he was quite key in that he, like, there's a lot of stuff that happened to Ostian that is is important 
for us to look at in that, you know, he's, and to begin with, he's like this uh, scruffy um, sculptor who everyone acknowledges is, is really good at what he does, but part of it is because he knows when to stop and when to control, and that he always has to work on his artistic skills and his talent um, that maybe a lot of people don't, don't realise and that actually perfection takes a lot of work and it's never perfect and that's the idea. Um, and then while that's, that's happening, obviously he gets, uh, he rebuffs um, Be- uh, Bekwa Kinska. Yeah. Um, and obviously that causes her to, to lash out at him and so starts off that type of arc. Um, yeah. And then obviously it's, it's peace with, with Serena and how, how that develops and, and continues to develop past this point anyway. Um, and it is it is all like one man's journey, seeing everything around him go this, this really negative way mm. and then deciding... You know, I I don't want to see this anymore, and locking himself away. But in doing so, has kind of doomed himself. I mean, thinking about it, he was probably dead no matter what. Because if he'd if he'd slept with Bequa and got to go down to the planet, probably if he'd slept with her, then him and Serena's friendship would have ended anyway. But then he would have been corrupted, same as everybody else. Yeah. So maybe it wouldn't have been. Maybe if they'd all been drinking the. Uh... The Slanesh Kool Aid. He'd he'd still be all right with Serena because they they'd be. Um, well, yeah, I suppose you know, so. That's it. But I think it's yeah, it's it's interesting because if yeah, as I said if he if he had gone down, then it would have changed it. But we would have lost our because he's us up until this yeah. point. He's effectively yeah. your your sane <clears throat> viewpoint into the madness, which was also yeah. to a degree what Solomon was as well. Yeah. And, and we, <laughs> we've lost. We've lost everyone. <laughs> now we're go, now now we've we've lost uh, Ostian. Yeah. And we've lost him at key points because after this loss, we go into. I believe we go into the, or we move very shortly. We'll go into the performance. Well, very shortly, um, but but I think Serena that... has got her moment first, doesn't she? Yeah. Um, so talking about keeping with sane characters, actually. Mm. So we lost Solomon. We lost uh, Vespasian, who was never really our eyes. And we've lost Austin. But someone who isn't corrupted, who we join, is Lucius, who is um, (laughs) (laughs) on the Andromedus um, in the Hall of Heroes. um, And he's walking down and all of the statues have been turned into monstrosities, where before they were um, statues of heroic Astartes. Mm-hmm. They've been re envisioned. Um, I think he describes one has has its head turned into that of a bull, yes. a bit like a minotaur, uh, and other twisted um, animals. Uh, and speaking of twisted animals, he's walking with uh, Islodon, um, and he's remembering that Islodon's, um, again, crap leadership ruined the chance to wipe out the traitors on Istvan Free. Uh, He managed to clear the way um, and because Arladon hadn't acted in time, Sal was able to outflank them uh, and push them back. Um, And he's still angry that um, Sal cheated by using um, backup essentially to end their fight and he had to Mm -hmm. run. Um, But he takes some glory and then the sparklings of, I guess, a bit of a uh, friendship here. Yeah. uh, he tells him um, how he tricked Solomon into killing his own men and then killed him himself. And they both uh, share a laugh in that. Have a bit um, of a chuckle, yeah. Yeah, and then they also share a laugh um, about the deaths of uh, Loken and uh, Torgaddon because obviously we know uh, they both don't... Oh, Sol, the, oh, sorry, not Sol. Lucius doesn't like Loken for breaking his nose. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Ildon doesn't like Torgaddon for um, gobbing off to him when they were on murder uh, and saying that Sal was the one who was uh, impressive and not him. Yeah. Uh, and then they both share their distaste of uh, targets. Um, <laughs> and they both then mention um, not seeing what happened to uh, ancient Rylanor. Uh, and Lucius yeah. says that he took himself underground, mumbling about protecting something. Yeah. Um, but now he's obviously buried under the earth and they're not worried about him. Um, 
so I don't know. I know you know a bit more than I do about that. But we won't spoil too much here, I guess. No spoilers. He does. Yeah, it, that's not the last we'll hear from him, but it's a while away before you do. Cool. Uh, and then um, Ardon is taking Lucius to see uh, Fabius Bile. Um, and we don't know why. Um, yeah, so a little bit of a catch up there with uh, our two um, heroes of the Empress Children. Yeah, Eidolon, who, you know, like no one likes, um, regardless of what, what he's doing. Um, and uh, Lucius, who, you know, we love to hate. Yeah. And at this point, they've probably um, outlasted everybody from uh, Horus Rising, and not including Primarchs. Um, we've had, probably had the most to do with these two for quite a long time. Yeah, uh, since appearance. their introduction. Yeah, they've, uh, they, they've been with us for a fair, fair while now. Um, yeah. And you wouldn't have expected it from Eidolon. Um, no. And as I said, Lucius is, is just... Lucius is Lucius. Like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, something... Some he's, he's marked for greatness, <laughs> is, is, our, is our boy <laughs> Lucius. Yeah. Friend of the show now, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> it. <laughs> it's exactly it. Um, so... Serena, fin- having finished her artwork of Fulgrim, uh, and also now her painting of Lucius, her sanity is become coming back to her. So whatever force was using her um, to craft these monstrosities, it, it's got what it needed out of her. Um, her eyes are now open, and she can just see the 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 mess um, that the she's dry, created. Dr- dried blood everywhere. Everything's busted up. There's yeah like barrels of uh, engravers acid full of corpses. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, the thing is, it's like she's waking from a dream, right? Yeah. She's like looking at this stuff like, no, that's not really there, is it? And then like, no. she's like, oh, I remember dreaming about that. And being like, no, no, hang on. That wasn't a dream. And it's yeah. like, you've done some nasty stuff. <laughs> yeah. And she's like completely like feral looking now. She, I mean, how long has this been? I mean, Ostium was in his chamber for months since he's yeah. in her and she was a state then so she must be like She's... coming onto Smeagol territory here yeah yeah um, absolutely will be a shell of a person yeah um and so she's she wakes up and she thinks i need to go and find ostian i need to apologize he needs to help me yeah um and she gets to her studio and at first um you know she manages to to, to get in and tragically finds him uh, propped up against the statue of the emperor yeah. we have a big sword for his chest um and obviously devastated absolutely devastated she finally tells him that she loves him which we knew was the case from when they first we first met them yeah uh, and she throws herself onto the sword and and, and she dies as well now and that's it uh, and that brings us on to uh, chapter 22. Um, we join Fulgrim, Julius and Marius on Istvan 5. This is our first trip to Istvan 5. We've heard a lot about it um, and we're finally there. And these guys are overseeing the fortification of the planet. Um, Julius is uh, pissed off. Um, he has obviously been growing um, his emotions um, he's just been becoming more and more bloodthirsty and he's been told, nope, we're not going to Istvan 3. Um, we're on Istvan 5 and we're doing um, builder's work and he's not happy. He didn't get to enjoy the battle um, and he's getting fed up. Um, they've heard the tales of uh, Isladon's uh, victories, um, telling him about what happened. Um, and Isladon's obviously told him it was a perfect victory. Um, another lie because for some reason he keeps getting to go off on these missions yeah. and doing a really crap job and then um yeah nobody seems to be um i don't understand it, why no, no, no one calls him up on it and like anyone ever, you know no one no one ever seems to mention it like what actually happened they're just like they take his word for it and no one in this company seems to speak up i mean he must have done some dodgy shit to get to hit Lord Commander position, like before before they even turn. I mean, he hasn't shown us any sort of 
um, strategic, strategic mastermind. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he's a lord. Like we get him as Lord Commander off the bat. There must be the Isle of Don story somewhere. His old rivalry from blagging it to the top. That's it. Like he's got. He's just got. I don't know, like naughty pictures of the Emperor and uh, Fulgrim, and that's it. Yeah. Like, he's, he's got, he's got <laughs> he's bribing him. Uh, and that's it. Um, I never lie from him. Um, yeah, whatever. He, he is useless, but he's done well. Um, Horace's fleet are now en route to Istvan 5. Um, he's confident that he has uh, wiped out any rebellion from Mr. Van Free. Yep. Um, there's no one else on the fleet unloyal uh, and they can concentrate on what's to come. Yep. Um, now that the fortifications are done, Fulgrim and his men, um, they get to return to the ship. They're going to uh, La Fenice for the premiere of um, Bequa's new sympathy, which has been created in Fulgrim's honour. Uh, and I believe this is what we've all been waiting for. If you like Slanesh, um, <laughs> Thanks for sticking with us for the last four videos because it's is, gonna is, get yeah, grim this now. <laughs> this is where it gets fully slanetry. Yeah. Uh, so we've got um, over three thousand Astartes, um, not in battle armor. They're in like their their dress togas, mm -hmm. um, crammed in here. We've got um, six thousand plus remembrances and ship crew there, um, all in standing and uh, on the lower floor, um, and they're all dressed ready for the ball. Um, up above, the captains all have box seats, and the, and obviously the who's who have all got seats. Uh, and Fulgrim and the senior commanders, uh, Julius and Marius, um, they have the um, the best view of the house, essentially. In the uh, it's called the Phoenix Nest. That's that the, the one. The name of yeah, yeah their, their, their little box. Yeah, um, and they've got um, yeah, it, they've got the the pricey chairs. So Julius is sat with uh, Fulgrim um, and Becca walks out onto the stage and she's basically wearing the most revealing dress. Uh, everything's on display. Um, and Julius here, as we mentioned, I think probably back in video one or two, feels some stirrings towards her. Mm -hmm. um, and he's shocked because he's never felt any sort of feeling towards a mortal woman before. Uh, he's always been about the art um and statues but now seeing her almost naked um arouses him yeah. um the music starts and julius is just sucked into the music it's beautiful um and as the music plays he's just hit with every emotion from from the joy to rage and to sadness and anything that you can feel he experiences it um and we really now we watch the show through julius's eyes yeah, because um, so it's it's, it's it's performing the uh, the the Maravigilia, the Maravigilia yeah. as it's called. Mm. Um, but the other bit that we as I said is worth noting is that um, a lot of the orchestra and the people playing um, are playing these instruments that are created by Bekwakinska. So they're not yeah. standard instruments; that they are mm -hmm. created especially for this. And they would be, I imagine, re recreating those noises from Le the Laren, the Lair Temple. The Lair Temple, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, he, Julius, he's looking around um, and he can just see the majority of people are just transfixed mm -hmm. by the music. Uh, and then he notices here and there groups of uh, people covering their ears in yep. disgust and trying to leave. And this enrages him. Um, no, one notable, he sees his friend and librarian, um, Evander Tobias, um, leading a group out. Uh, and this just like boils his blood. Um, and obviously, he's not the only one who feels this way because um, a group of audience members attack um, Evander and his group uh, and mercilessly like, beat them to death. Um, and Julius just feels like immense uh satisfaction when he just sees someone stamp on uh evander's skull killing him um which is mad because that was his his confidant that was um for if you go back to Loken and cinderman yeah. this was julius and and tobias really i know we only saw uh one sort of 
interaction with them. But I mean, we got the understanding that they were um, pretty close as as a starties a man could be. Yeah. Um, and obviously, not now. I know we discussed it earlier um, episode. Obviously, we said, mate, did um, Tobias give him that book on purpose? But I think now we know that. Yeah, he just gave him a book to say, "Open your eyes, mate," um, and not yeah. realizing what he had done. Yeah. Um, but as we've said, he's dead now. Uh, so, and this is happening all over the arena. Uh, the non-believers are being truly um, discovered and being attacked. Um, and then, as soon as they're killed, the attackers are going back to watching the show as if nothing's happened. Yeah. Um, so Julius looks back to the stage. And the back curtain drops and um, a scene is revealed exactly recreating the Lair Temple. Um, and this singer is revealed. Um, and the way this woman or this singer is singing is inhuman. Um, and it's affecting like all of Julius's senses. Like mm. as the music were, this is just taking him to another level. Uh, and he's able to look around and he sees both Arladon and Marius just transfixed they're in their chairs they can't they're not moving they're 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 hooked um which before i go too far obviously they weren't in the temple they've had the injections and they've had the surgery yeah but they're being affected by this now so obviously there was something a bit more um kool-aid like in uh fabius's work yeah, there's well, you know, it's it's produced off the back of the the lair themselves, and if they were, you know, chaos tainted, then uh, then perhaps that's what you know that's what's done it. That that's what's um, affecting them. It could also yeah. be that it's just it's so you know so powerful that they were always you know gonna be tainted, and so mm. they've just they've fallen under its spell as well. But it, I would feel that it's probably, as you said, to do with Fabius and his. Um, I'd his, like to think what if. Uh, Tarvit and Solomon were there, how they would react because obviously we've got Evander Tobias before the singer came out mm. like they were able to get away from the music so I wonder if those two guys who were clearly never, or, or even like we saw, um, especially like for, for certain, uh, Vespasian was not weak No, he would, so he resisted the portrait if he was there, What I wonder what effect that would have and if yeah. it is yeah like you say the surgery it's is in the in the layer dna mm. um <clears throat> so they transfix their chairs and they bring a new meaning to the word uh jaw dropping because their jaws stretch um so far that julius can hear the bones breaking in their mouths as yeah. they're um stretching down um, and then he looks at Fulgrim and just sees, uh, looks into his eyes and just sees this pure darkness in the galaxy um, within his eyes. And Fulgrim tells him uh, he never imagined such power. And now he can see what was promised by Horus. Yeah. Um, and then Julius can also now um, physically see the music slivering around. Like he's just seeing the sound. Um, like he's on uh, some absolute acid trip now um watching an 80s metal cartoon or something (laughs) (laughs) um and uh now down below all the mortals now they're either killing or they're shagging um and it's just an absolute bloody orgy yeah um and the stars because they're obviously not necessarily sexually driven but now they're stamping on heads and they're killing anything they can get their hands on um eating flesh uh drinking the blood ripping skin off and wrapping it around themselves uh, it's just absolutely gone uh bananas down there um <clears throat> the musicians are now playing possessed like they're playing in a way that you you couldn't physically play they're going faster than you could go yeah. um the singer starts to scream in pain but continues to sing like she she's screaming in pain but the sounds are still coming out the same and her body is twisting and caught um uh and bones are breaking and she's just getting snapped left right and center um, yeah. and then she, she dies like she just twists herself to death um but the song continues to come out of her um and the song is so powerful that um the singer bursts uh, and transforms into this bizarre 
um, like half demon, half crab. Um, it's a like de- half... a, a demonette. A demonette, yeah. So in the law, she becomes a demonette of Slanesh. Um, and that's described as like part crab, part sex demon, <laughs> is what I wrote down. I mean, that, that's a fair description, right? <laughs> They're, uh, you know, pictures and like the, the, old, the old miniatures were quite funny um, because the classic miniatures, it was, it was like you'd have this like little like female form and then there would be like a massive crab claw on the end and it'd be like okay that's a bit that's a bit funky <laughs> they've made them a bit sleeper now but yeah, yeah. um a demonette cool uh and she's not the only one um the music increases and five other band members transform into the same demonettes uh, and they kill the rest of the band and yeah. then they uh, actually kill Bequa herself um and then the creatures scamper off of uh, the stage and they join in the killing What's um, interesting here is I don't think Bequa is that unhappy. <laughs> no, um, it doesn't say so. And it's like I get the impression like that she's she's, she's so enraptured by it all anyway that it's kind of like yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I don't know how much time she gets to sort of realize what's going on, but obviously she's obviously corrupted. So she's, something in her mind saying yeah. this, yeah, she something in her head said this is what you're going for. Mm. So she probably she was probably over the moon when that first one came out. She went, "Yep, yeah. here we go." Um, but sadly, that st- they that that stops the music. Uh, now your band's dead, uh, and this causes um, the Astari's actual physical pain. Um, everything now they've even pain has been pleasurable to them, but this is mm. actual pain, uh, and it's starting to be maddening. So Marius leaps off the box uh, onto the stage, and he picks up a music uh, an instrument. Um, and starts picking up um, music and other Astartes follow his lead. Yeah. Uh, and um, they resume the song and it doesn't take too long. Um, and they manage to master these instruments almost straight away. And these sonic bursts start coming out of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, out of the instruments. Um, and when these sound waves are hitting people, it's causing them to explode. Yeah. Uh, and I would say that this is the birth of the noise marines. It is. It is indeed. You're very astute there. That's exactly it. These are the uh, the noise marines, or what, that, what I think they go on to call them, the uh, cacophony. Um, cacophony. Uh, you know, very uh, apt mm. name um, of, yeah, sets of marines that will take these, these instruments uh, into battle. Um, because they realise that obviously not only do they, um, not only do they do they obviously send this this chaotic pleasurable music around around wherever they are, but they can also be used to uh, cause people a bit of bother if they're if they're not corrupt. Mm. And I've seen the model of the noise marine with the guitar and the, the old school big ones. boots. Yeah. yeah, I like. I want to get one of them. Are there other noise marine models? Because I haven't looked. There are so there's yeah. there's the depending on which one you looked at there are two or there are at least two variations from the old school so from sure. back in the nineties and that they're the ones that look like they're punk rockers where they're like you know zebra print yeah and power armor and uh, classic fenders and you're like all right this is just the that that's classic GW being a bit of a bit of fun having a bit of fun with it um, there are more serious models. Yeah, um, that are what you would call the cacophony. Um, so they're they they're like they're less guitar looking and more sure. kind of gun looking, but have kind of this amplifier look to them. So they're okay. serious models, and then there's yeah. kind of like the the nineties uh, more fun models. Um, yeah. But yeah, noise noise marines are are definitely playable. Um, yeah, uh, they're just as I said, it, like depending on which. Chaos Legion, you play as you get some rules and others you don't. So Death Guard mm. are getting a lot of love at the moment, but Corn, Slanesh, the others, not so much. So although you can play for them, play play as them, and they're playable. Um, I don't know what the rules look like for them. Yeah, anymore. no, I've, I mean, like I said, I've seen the older models. I, I want to get one because just for a bit of fun. And it's exactly. I, I definitely like. You know, that's definitely worth looking on eBay just just to paint one. Because uh, yeah, you know they're cool models. Maybe um, tangent. We should um, get five and then paint them <laughs> up and, and compare them on the podcast. 
I think that'd be what, what would you trick. call the band? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, but Dave would be all over it. He loves it. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Very true. Um, but unfortunately, the um, the pro- production is finished now, um, and we are uh, going to go into chapter twenty-three with uh, the Iron Hands, and we are with Captain Bowhan on the fer- ferum, um, yeah. and he's not alone. He is got uh, Ferris Manis and Korax of the Raven Guard and Vulcan of the Salamanders. Um, and they're discussing their uh, attack strategy. They're ready to go, but the rest of the Iron Hands have not arrived yet. Um, and neither have the Alpha Legion, the Word Bearers, the Iron Warriors or the Night Lords. They're just not there yet. Um, but they do get word that the other legions are only a few hours behind. Yep. So Ferris Manus, um, jumping the gun, declares that they will strike now while the iron is hot. Um, they can um, get down there, start the attack, and the rest can arrive and help reinforce the attack. Yeah. Um, he is going to uh, lead the vanguard uh, and go um, up the centre. Not a necessarily an iron hands um phrase but one that we've come to get to terms with in this book yeah uh, and Corex and Vulcan are going to take the flanks yeah and he he really wants this because obviously yeah. he he wants to end Fulgrim effectively mm. he wants to reclaim his honour and there's also the other part I think he has a conversation with Centaur at one point about um, and I don't know if this is to come but we'll talk about it anyway he, he yeah. kind of talks about how if Fulgrim saw in him that he, he may have been turned to a traitorous cause, yeah. then, then maybe the, 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 the loyalist primarchs could think the same thing. And That's he, it, yeah. he doesn't want them to think that. He wants to restore his honour by, by taking out the traitor and showing that he is anything but that. That, that yeah. you know, whatever reason Fulgrim thought he could turn him, he's not, he's not to be turned. That's it. And, and that's it. Because Santa, I think, says we can rebuild, we can take time. Yeah. And, and Ferris Manis is very much of the mind of, no, if I don't act now, then I'm going to be tainted and won't get a chance. Um, so he's, yeah, he's shooting early um, yeah. to, to avenge himself. Um, and even, I think, uh, between Corox and Vulcan, they say, well, let's just wait a bit. But they're so swept up in Ferris Manis' uh, eagerness that they agree to the plan. Yeah. Um, so down on Istvan Five, the Sons of Horus, the Death Guard, the World Eaters, and the Emperor's Children have built uh, fortifications strong enough to hold off the Loyalist Legions. Um, our friends of the uh, Dyes Array are stationed on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. Um, Princess Turnit uh, has vowed to atone for the treachery which took place on t- on board his Titan previously. Um, which was obviously um, some tragic events there. Yeah. Poor old um, jobs. And that was uh, that was uh, the start of what you said: uh, the good guys getting killed yeah. <laughs> when you think good things are going to happen. Um, so the forces are waiting for the loyalists to attack, uh, and suddenly thousands of drop pods begin to descend from the sky. Uh, Horus is within the keep with Fulgrim and Angron. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he tells them that this is the day that the loyalists meet their doom. Um, so, drop pods are landing. Um, Raven Guard, uh, Iron Hands, and Salamanders start pouring out. Um, the battle rages on with Astartes killing and dying in hundreds. Yeah. Um, like, I don't think you could physically envision the amount of or the size and scale of this war no um, they, they, they give it the numbers don't they so that i think it's there's about thirty thousand traitors i think it mm. is to forty thousand loyalists but that's considered even because um the the traitors are embedded right they're, they're in dug in yeah positions. they're dug in um and they've got titan and they've got yeah the, the dsra and i would say yeah. that i would probably with those numbers and the fact that they're dug in, I would probably put it more towards the traitors. Um, if you're yeah. looking at it from that point of view, and um, you've almost you've almost got four four full defending legions, and yeah. really you've got two attacking legions and whatever iron hands came with him. With the defending, in, in all fairness, the defending legions are not full strength because they've had to purge their uh, 
Oh yeah, I guess they've had to they've had to purge them. But even so, that's that's why their numbers are are a bit lower. Um, yeah. Even so, um, they're 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 dug in and they've got defenses. Um, yeah. So it's going to be like a regardless of of what else happens, it's going to be a bloody attritional battle. Yeah. Um, and that's what it and, seems to be. <laughs> yeah, and like you say, we get to see that now. Like, the, so we jump around a little bit here. We have the Morlocks um, of the Iron Hand pushing forward relentlessly, tearing through the enemy lines. Um, the Salamanders on one side are, are, are using flamers to burn paths through the enemy, uh, and Korax and the Raven Guard are using their jump packs and they're hopping from enemy cluster to enemy cluster, cutting them apart and moving on. On the uh, traitor side. Angron is destroying warriors in his droves. Mm. I mean, we've seen him attack already, and we also saw him attack his own uh, his uh, his own um, uh, world eaters. World eaters previously, and I mean, the guy doesn't give a toss, does he? He just smashes through them. Um, we've got uh, Mortarian swinging his scythe back and forth, taking scores of warriors out, um, and then. The only uh, Horus and Fulgrim are not on the battlefield, but yeah. Abaddon and Aximand are leading the Sons of Horus, killing as they go. Uh, and now those legions are still Astartes as we know them. Um, but the Empress children have changed. Um, yeah. They have decorated their armour in extravagant, stretched out flesh, um, decorating their armour. Yeah. Um, some of them, I mean, Eilidon and Marius are going to be uh, transformed, obviously, with their jaws have been Wide, snapped. Like, just open, forever open in a Richter yeah. stream. Um, and they are using their brand new instruments of war to uh, blow apart the enemy. Isn't it Marius? Um, is it Marius that has his eyes, like, cut open or his eyelids cut off one of them i'm sure it's like yeah he, he can't close his eyes because he's, he's like cut his eyelids off just so he can he can't not see um the battle yeah he's like literally um he's like the most twisted now like his yeah. like you say his my his mouth is open and this permanent scream is coming out it's just unstopped he's had his eyes sewn open um like you say and his ears have been ripped off yeah. um i guess to let more sound in uh for however just, that works yeah um the two the two sides are so matched they're just bumping blunt head-to-head combat uh killing as they go julius um he's in the fray he's killing uh iron hands he's just fully corrupted and every kill he makes elates him every injury he feels is just pleasurable mm. um and he sees um, Santar and Santa. the Morlocks approaching, and he is good to go. Um, and Maris's band unleashed their music on uh, the group of Morlocks and obviously stunned some of them, uh, and they're able to leap into the fight. Um, and Santar is, like, horrified at these monsters' this fight. This isn't what he expected. Yeah. Um, I mean, only... A month ago or so, he was fighting these guys. Well, he was attacked by these guys. Um, and now they're not even resembling what his, what essentially are his brothers. Um, and he goes one-on-one with Julius, ready for revenge. Uh, and Julius is like a, a, a screaming demon slashing at him. Yeah. Um, and he's able to grab uh, Julius's sword and snap it. And that explodes and, in his grip and sends Julius to the floor and um in and he's screaming in pain and he goes over to stamp on julius's skull because he's wearing his morlock terminator armor um and as he goes to do it he sort of pauses uh, and looks down and realizes that julius isn't writhing in pain but he's actually in pleasure he's loving uh, it. and oh, what an idiot like yeah. julius now uses this uh, distraction and for the second time stabs him in the groin and this time instead of going down he He goes up up the center uh and kills him um don't hesitate man don't hesitate no i mean it's happened a couple of times it's just that second is all you need when you're in a starty with that level of uh, reflex and like at this point julius is also pretty grim because he's all burnt up and like his, his lips are all gone and he's just like this 
skeletal features, um, he's, bones coming he's, through his cheeks. Yeah. He, he's, he's just rancid. Yeah, he's probably messed up and like is just loving every every moment of sensation that's just driving him to, you know, either kill in more extravagant ways or put himself in more danger so that he can get hurt. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, man. Pre- it's pretty grim. Um, yeah. So, Centaur, idiot, he's dead. <laughs> yeah. And um, things are looking pretty grim for the loyalists. But, but they keep they keep talking about uh, like it it it, it said, uh, refer to it a couple of times about how even it is that the uh, the line of the traitors is not is not breaking, but it is bending, and it's yeah. bending in the middle where Ferris is. Uh, you know, he's pushing forward, searching for Fulgrim. Yeah, I mean, um, he's, he's got the um, the pure rage is driving him through. Uh, yeah. And, and the guys with him are obviously, um, I imagine Mortarian and, and uh, Angron must be off to the flank somewhere. Yeah. Um, and he's going, where, where they're holding steady, he's pushing through because obviously Horace and Fulgrim aren't on the battlefield. Um, but things are starting to look a bit grim. Um, it's a bit of a standstill, and then suddenly, uh, reinforcements, thousands more drop pods start falling, uh, and we see finally the Alpha Legion, the Word Bearers, Iron Warriors, and Night Lords have come to save the day. Yeah. Um, and as we said, uh, chapter 24, Ferris Manis is fighting his way through the enemy, looking for Fulgrim. He sees the troops landing. Um, the Alpha Legion and the Night Lords on the flanks, uh, and the, where the Word Bearers and the Iron Warriors swelling his ranks at the rear. This drives him forwards um, with more uh, um, enthusiasm. Mortarian and Angron, um, they start withdrawing their forces back towards the fortress, breaking yeah. the lines. Um, and Ferris Manus gets sight of uh, Fulgrim standing on the battlefield, ushering the Empress' children back into the fortress. Um, Korax and Vulcan advise holding, letting the reinforcements take up the assault so they can regroup because they've obviously taken some horrendous losses by this point. Yeah. Uh, and they should um, take some pride, regroup, um, and, and then join in the fight when the numbers have caught up. Let, let um, their brothers take some of the glory, as uh, exactly. I, think they, I think Korax suggests. Yeah, badly worded, really, because um, Ferris Manis uh, isn't having that because he's there <laughs> for glory. Yeah. Um, he's consumed with the revenge, ignores the warnings, and he has 50 Morlocks with him still surviving and charges towards uh, Fulgrim. Yeah. Um, and as they manage to finally get there, fighting their way, he manages to finally get to... Uh, Fulgrim and Ferris, Man- Fer- Ferris and Manis uh, withdraws um, the rebuilt uh, Fireblade and tells him that he's going to kill Fulgrim with a weapon that he's forged by his own hand. Yeah. Um, Fulgrim obviously shows um, Forgebreaker and says he's going to do the same and kill him with the Warhammer. And uh, at this point, Fulgrim is also... He's truly appreciating um, how much Ferris hates him. Yeah, um, because like there, there are still moments that where you, you, you don't know whether you're dealing with um, the Fulgrim that's possessed yeah. or the Fulgrim in his right mind. And like yeah. moments like this where he's kind of like he's he's seeing his brother Theris who's, who hasn't withdrawn, who hasn't decided to stay his hand is, is, is you know, powered by hatred. Um, mm. And he's reforged the blade um, to use to kill him. And yeah. it's like, wow, he really hates me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's it, is it. I mean, he's still a Primark, so he's still got that level of power there that yeah. subconscious is, is peeping through. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, so uh, he tries to, they try, they try again, they try and talk. Uh, Ful- Fulgrim tells him, uh, how wrong he was and tells him that Ferris Manus will die a traitor's death but gives him that sort of last ultimatum. He does um, give him a way out. He still says to him, like, you can still still join, join us. Him, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. We'll t- I'll take you to Horace and um, and we can sort it all out. 
because like you say, Fulgrim still loves him. Yeah. Um, it's, it's Ferris Manus who's had enough. Yeah. Um, and he tells him, and, and Ferris Manus tells him that he's going to die. It's over. And and Fulgrim says, "Do you really think that Horace was going to let himself be trapped here? Take a look around." Um, and gives and gives him that chance to to look back on the battlefield and. We see the Raven Guard and Salamanders are retreating towards the lines drawn at the back by the Iron Warriors. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're carrying their dead and wounded with them. And you've got um, Vulcan and Korax themselves leading the way, um, encouraging their men back to safety. Um, all three of the Loyalist Legions have suffered horrendous losses. Uh, and it says like that it's going to be hard for them to recover from what's happened today. Um, and the Iron Warriors are stood st- silent, watching the injured legions march towards them. And silent, and, despite the uh, the number of inbound box calls for yeah. aid and assistance and uh, medical help. Uh, they're just no, grimly, grimly silent. No apoth- apothecary is being sent out. It's, we'll wait. And a lone flare is sent from the fortress. And the Iron Warriors um, open fire, joined by the other three legions mm. that came to reinforce the loyalists and the war masters forces turn. And essentially we have um, a box now, uh, a killing box um, and the iron hands, salamanders and Raven guard are trapped in absolute waves of fire. Uh, Vulcan disappears within a huge explosion yeah. and Korax is engulfed in wave after wave of fire. And that, is the last we see of either of those two Primarchs for this book. Uh, and their men are just getting annihilated. Um, and Ferris Manis cannot believe what he's just seen. I absolutely gutted. Um, and Fulgrim again says, surrender or you will be exterminated. And Ferris Manis says he only fears uh, dishonor and vows to end Fulgrim there and then. Yeah. And they go for it. They go for a fight. The weapons they forged themselves and gifted to each other are now forged by themselves to kill each other. Um, Ferris uh, Fulgrim swings a blow, hitting Ferris Manis on the temple. I mean, he must have a head <laughs> of. I don't know what his head's made out of. I mean, he survived two hits with that warhammer. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, the first one knocked him out, all right, but this one just puts him down to one knee. That's just insane. <laughs> he goes down. He slashes against uh, Fulgrim's stomach, cutting from armour to flesh. And here, Fulgrim feels the pain, but no pleasure. Mm. And this brings both of them to their knees. Um, Ferris Manis gets to his feet. Um, and Fulgrim, who's still down, cries out for his brother. And essentially... Um, I didn't write out exactly what was said, but I've written Ferris, uh, Ferris Manus tells Fulgrim to get fucked uh, <laughs> and swings at his head with yeah. his sword. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Fulgrim defends himself with the Alaire sword spring into action. Uh, and as he does, the purple stone glows and emits smoke um, surrounding them both. Um, and Fulgrim is given an unnatural strength. Um, whereas if this sword hadn't been yeah. in the picture, Ferris Manis would have won this. Uh, um, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. But um, yeah, Fulgrim's able to get up, push Ferris Manis away, and he goes on the attack, stabbing and slashing uh, and forcing um, Ferris Manis to the ground. Uh, and Ferris and voice... is, is, is super surprised by, by given the fact they battled each other to a standstill and then suddenly Fulgrim's Very... just back up it again. He's like, what? This is, especially as he went for the, that killing blow, which yeah. just ended out of nowhere. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's it's completely taken back. Um, he gets put to the ground and Fulgrim's looking down at Ferris Manis and he looks into... Um, Ferris Manus' eyes and sees his own reflection and mm-hmm. f- for the first time sees um, what he's become. And not just like uh, mentally, but he, 
he, he gets a good look at what he's been doing to himself. Yeah. Which pauses him. And he, he can't bring the sword down, can he? He's trying to let go of it. Um, and I think he's con- like Serena, his consciousness comes back um, and he realizes, oh my God, like, what have I done? And he's trying to put this sword down, but can't. Uh, and then he sees uh, Ferris Manis is reaching for his sword. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Fulgrim now, he's actually resisting the sword, but he's yeah. not in control of his body. Um, and he brings the sword up and swings it down on Ferris Manis and lands the killing blow. Yeah. Um, which is mad because I didn't, I haven't read much past um, this. I mean, I'm in book nine. Uh, didn't know what I was getting into with the heresy. Didn't expect a Primarch to die in book five, if I'm honest. Um, so that, well, yeah, it's, it's I wasn't inter- expecting it. It's an interesting one. Um, yeah, I, you know, I don't, when I first read it, I don't think I was expecting it either. Um, no. I suppose they, they have to go at one one point or another. And oh yeah, I think we we do hear from Ferris again, but I don't like it's flashbacks. He's dead. Like he is dead. Yeah. Dead. Like he's not like some of the other Primarchs and stuff like that. He's obviously you know in the law. He's not the first to have gone as there are the two other Primarchs that we don't know anything about. No. Um, but he's the first named one to go. Yeah. And it's it's a big, you know, it's a big deal. Yeah. In recorded, for, uh, in recorded Warhammer history, he's the uh, first one yeah. uh, named to go. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't know what I was, I still don't know what to expect really, but yeah, um, wasn't expecting that. Um so yeah, uh, he's dead, and as he, as Fulgrim kills Ferris Manis, uh, he feels like the weight lifted. He feels spirits leave him, mm. and he's able to drop the sword and cries out, "Throne, what have I done?" So instantly back to Fulgrim, where they always used to swear on the throne. On the, the um, throne, yeah, yeah, that's come come back, um, and the voice is still there, and it's teasing him. Um, and it tells him the truth of what he's done. It says all Ferris Manis wanted to do was honour you. Yeah. And you've turned on him. And it tells him the truth of everything that's happened. When um, the uh, Ferris Manis used his own ship to save uh, the Firebird from being blown up, it tells him the truth of it. It tells him the truth of Solomon um, getting to the bridge because he wanted to honour the Primarch, not show him up. Um, and Fulgrim is completely devastated. Um, he realised what he's done. The mask has been removed, and he he just realises I am disgusted. I'm a monster, yep. and he picks up Fireblade uh, and goes to kill himself. Um, but the voice stops him and says, "Look at what you've done. You don't deserve a noble suicide. Uh, what you can have is oblivion. You can yeah. cease to exist. There's nothing, no afterlife. There's just nothing. You'll just be nothing." Um, Accept me, you won't even have to feel this pain anymore. Um, and Fulgrim accepts it, he accepts it like this sounds good to me. I don't want to feel this pain anymore. Do what you have to do. Um, and he accepts absolutely willingly, um, and allows this uh beast into him. And mm-hmm. as he does, um, he the second this. Entity starts entering him. He realizes he's made a horrible mistake again. <laughs> um, and yeah, he's just uh, he gets pushed. His consciousness gets pushed into the the corner of his mind. Yeah, uh, and he's trapped uh, forever to be a silent witness to his own body's demise. Um, he's still got his memories of what he's done. Yeah, uh, nothing's been wiped out of his mind, but now. He's stuck inside his own head watching this demon control his body. Um, and that ends that chapter. But before we move on to the final part, he should have just stabbed himself with the sword, surely. Like, that and Oblivion are the same thing. Unless there's, like, a, a, a Primark afterlife that I don't know about. I don't Well, I mean, you know, I don't know, souls and the warp and all that sort of stuff. But, yeah, I think he just, like... 
I think it's that he got. I think one of the things is with Fulgrim, and you can see it's, a, it's, it's like, in a way, he can be a bit cowardly. Yeah. Because he didn't, you know, he didn't, he did, he couldn't bring himself to kill his brother. Um, even, you know, and, and I, I get why he couldn't do that, but like, there's lots mm. of stuff he couldn't bring himself to do, even though he traveled a long way down that path. Yeah. And then he's come to a point where actually, you know, one way out is for him to top himself. But again, he couldn't do that. And he gives in every time he gives in to the uh, the whisperings or the control of this other being. Um, yeah. And so I think it just, you know, it's it's like his his weakness is is, is to his extent his feelings at the time. Um, yeah. So, you know, in this, this case, it's like his grief. Um, and he just, you know, he, he looks for a slightly easier way out. And that is like, you know, I don't have to do it myself. This, this warp spawn, this being can just take it all away and then I don't have to worry about it. It's gone, it's done, done and it's gone. Um, and yeah, he should have just killed himself, but he didn't. Yeah. And that's part of the tragi- tragic, um, another tragic story in the, uh, the Horus Heresy. Yeah. All over a bloody sword as well. Yeah, which he now looks at and says should never have picked it up. <laughs> and if he hadn't, it. it'd be interesting to know if if they hadn't gone to Loreen, they'd gone somewhere else. Mm. What would have happened? Because because clearly Fulgrim was never going to turn traitor. Uh, no. If it wasn't for this mind uh, fogging. Yeah. No. He. Yeah. You're right. He wouldn't have done. But the reason he ended up going down that path is because even if you go back to the Laren campaign, mm. it's his character flaws. It's his pursuit of perfection and it's yeah. his process of doing it that's caused him to be in that temple at that place in that way. Um, yeah. If it had been another Primarch, like, I don't know, Gilliman or something like that, maybe he wouldn't have charged in headlong. You know, they would have done some scouting, they would have done some other things, and they might have been like, yeah, we're just going to nuke this place. <laughs> rather than, like, charging into the uh, the cesspit of Slanesh. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's his, again, it's his human character flaws. And this is, like I said, we're getting into the, the, the thematics here. But like a lot of these books at this point, with the Primarchs, you know, one of the things that we're always talked about is their distance from humanity. Mm. But as, you know, but actually, it's their human flaws that are causing their downfall and their, yeah. their differences and stuff like that. So, you know, Horace is, it's, it's like his, his ego and his ambition. Um, in um, uh, Fulgrim, it's very much like his his pursuit of perfection, this need to be perfect, and this kind of unrealistic expectation that he's put for himself through the Emperor's eyes, even though that's never there. Um, and that's that's led him down this road. And then mm-hmm. uh, even to a lesser extent, like uh, Ferris Manus, you know, he, he's been undone by his... Uh, desire to seek vengeance and and maintain honour um, yeah. through through a perceived idea that others would find him dishonourable. None of which is has proved out in any of the you know the bits and pieces from his conversations with like Corax and Vulcan. None or Corax and Vulcan. Neither of them were like, yeah, well, you're, you're sketchy. Like they're not stupid, are they? They're, they're going to say, oh, Fulgrim's a traitor. He spoke to you last. What what did you do? Yeah. Like, it's unreasonable, isn't it? Um, paranoia. Yeah, and, um, and that's 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 what that's the tragic arc of the the books right now. It's the human frailty that's leading to their their downfall. They're they're, yeah. they're you know so disconnected from humanity, but actually it's their humanity that's causing causing them to fall fall from the emperor's light. Yeah, big time. But uh, yeah, sad 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 turn of events there. Yeah. Um, but we move on to the final chapter. Um, the traitor legions have slaughtered the loyalists. Only a few bands of loyalists are able to survive and escape via um, drop ships. Yeah. Um, but huge uh, quantities have been wasted. Um, small bands have been able to uh, break free uh, and get away. Um, but the Salamanders, uh, Iron Hands, and the Raven Guard—they're essentially ruined now. 
Um, yeah. As, as military forces in the, the heresy, they, they play, you know, they're not going to play. I mean, they do, you know, they do. The, the troops from those uh, legions do obviously go on to play a part, but they're not significant enough as a military force to really um, impact the, the, uh, the path of the heresy at this point. Yeah. Um, so we um, clean up the battle now. Um, Lucius and his new friend Arladon are um, watching bodies of the dead being cremated. They're sort of chilling out um, sat on top of uh, a land raider watching mm. menials do the work um, and they Lucius now we're through Lucius's eyes and he's watching uh, all this work get done and they look up high on the fortress at the now the, the traitor Primarchs um, we've got uh, Lorgar Mortarian Angron um, stood together yeah. Fulgrim's up there but he stood off to one side um, and then what I liked here is um, he says that Alpharius is stood um, next to the Primarchs, but stood erect as if attempting to match the stature of those around him. Yeah. Um, which, without spoiling too much, if you don't know Alpha Legion, then it's, it's it, the first time I read this, it, it was I didn't even pick up on it. But it's, no. only because I, I, it's only because I've read Legion and then reread this that it got my head. But I obviously don't know anything, but it's got my mind wondering. Uh, and I'll leave that there. And then yes. Horace is stood on the next platform alone, um, watching all around him uh, and watching now his great works. Um, so now Horace is inside his fortress, um, where whenever this is, waiting for the other Primarchs to leave on their missions to take war to the Loyalists and uh, head towards terror. The path uh, to and, terror. Yeah. And Fulgrim enters his chamber and basically chucks Ferris's manus head at him. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and Horace is absolutely disgusted. Uh, I mean, he's glad that, well, it's one of those things. He's glad that Ferris Manus is dead because Ferris Manus wasn't going to join, but he's also saddened that Ferris Manus is dead because obviously he wanted all of his brothers to join him. Um, I don't know how much he cares about Astartes, but I think in an ideal world, he would have had all the Primarchs join him. Yeah. Um, because there's that bond of, uh, of being brothers. But uh, the way that Fulgrim is walking and talking, he notices that something is not quite right. And then Fulgrim out and out tells him, well, Fulgrim doesn't. The demon says, yeah. this isn't Fulgrim you're dealing with. Uh, I have taken over uh, Fulgrim's body. Here's the hows and the whys. You don't need to know too much, but yep, Fulgrim's uh, not in charge anymore. Um, and he says, the only reason that Fulgrim turned traitor is because of my involvement. Yep. Um, he would have never joined you. Um, if it wasn't for me, the second you told him that, he would have run for terror, um, which like we just spoke about clarifies that Fulgrim was not a traitor he was completely screwed over by picking up that sword yeah um and Horace is like shocked um and he they have a bit of a back, back and forth but the the demon says don't worry uh I'm here to I'm here to help yeah. um I, I'll I'll do whatever you want like for the time being I'm one of yours Horace says okay but do not tell the other Primarchs um, we keep it between us but in his head he secretly vows to um, free Fulgrim one way or another yeah. because although he's just found out that yeah, Fulgrim wouldn't have helped me um, he doesn't like the fact that this demon's controlling a Primarch No and he doesn't, he doesn't like the idea that his brother's um, you know is still his brother that yeah. he's consigned to this 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 maddening fate of being trapped within his own mind, um, mm. and just you know the 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 madness that that's gonna gonna induce. Yeah, and I think the demon even says like, yeah, no, I I, I wasn't gonna get rid of him because like even now I hear his like uh, his his like him, his complaining and his begging and stuff like that in the back of my head, and it it brings me it brings me joy. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Exactly. He's like, I'm enjoying, 
I'm I'm enjoying him screaming. Yeah. Um, because yeah, this is what they get their kicks out of, isn't it? Punishment. Um, Mac, uh, Fulgrim is well and truly regretting um, every, every decision he's made since we, we picked him up in this book, pretty much. Yeah. Probably wishes that he'd stayed with uh, Horus maybe for a bit longer rather than venturing off on his own. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think that might have, uh, you know, again, tragic uh, moments that, you know, had they changed to be slightly different, uh, would have ended things differently. Because, you know, let's say if Fulgrim had stuck around, um, would would Horus have ever ever ended up on um, Davin? Like, yeah, a whole, whole, whole host of things could have happened differently. Yeah, what, I, what I did like, I don't know whether it's mentioned at this point or if it's a bit before, um, but they talk about the, uh, the 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 portrait of Fulgrim. That's the last paragraph. Fine, I will yeah. I'll wait for that before we get to that. Um, we're very we're very near there. So essentially, this is wrap up now. Um, mm-hmm. So we get a bit of a look into the plans of the future, uh, which will take us into further books, I imagine. So the traitors' plans from here are that Horus Angron. Fulgrim, Mortarian, and Lorgar are all going to head to Mars um, now, um, and they're going to secure it in Horus's name and create a base from there. Yep. Uh, the Alpha Legion will be sent to intercept the Space Wolves, whose attack on Magnus is now um, happened. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess the burning of Prospero is done, or at least underway. Yep. Uh, and once they've done um, their attack on the Space Wolves, they're going to go and intercept the White Scars uh, and stop them from backing them up. Yep. Um, the Night Lords are being sent to Ward's Terror to attack nearby strongholds um, that could essentially reinforce the Loyalists and scupper any uh, attacks by the traitors. Um, the Iron Warriors are being sent to directly attack the Imperial Fists um, um, because they tried to get to Istvan and um, as we found out at the end of mm-hmm. Eisenstein, um, was it Sigismund? Yeah. Um, was sent with some um, of his men. Um, and they have essentially, they didn't get there in time. And the Iron Warriors are going to go and make them pay. And Horace is on board his ship. Uh, and Magglehurst brings him a message from Magnus the Red. But we do not hear the message. Um, and then, yep, to wrap it up, the last bit is... The thing controlling Fulgrim, mm-hmm. um, he goes and retrieves the uh, Amaphane from Ostian, and he's surprised to see uh, Serena, and a little bit amused and confused to see Serena also um, yeah. impaled there. Um, and he's very much enjoying the fact that no one on this ship knows um, that there's a demon controlling the Primarch. Um, but he has a weird feeling that Lucius... Um, is wise to him. He, yeah, he's still something in sort of Lucius's um, the way he looks at him. Um, but to keep him sweet, he's given him the silver uh, lair sword because he doesn't need it anymore. No, it's no longer possessed, but it's still a a, a pretty a pretty solid blade. Yeah, uh, and then I'll let you wrap up as he enters uh, La Fenice to look at the um, the painting. Yeah, and. Um... It's it's interesting because it kind of hints at the idea that um, like the obviously the the greater demons trapped in this sword, but um, had also you know potentially been in this painting. And and like when they were arguing, like when you had Fulgrim arguing amongst themselves, like is he arguing at the painting? Is he arguing with the sword? We're never sure, but clearly something is is amiss here. Um, yeah, and now. The painting is is of Fulgrim, um, and and it's it's kind of like the 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 implication is that this is uh, the embodiment of where Fulgrim's consciousness is now trapped. Yeah. Um, that he's 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 it's a bit like um, uh, what's it the portrait of Dorian Gray? That's um, the one, yeah. Yeah, in that in that there's there's this the, the the portrait of Fulgrim, and that contains Fulgrim's actual mind. And while this picture exists the demon is inhabiting his, his actual body. Um, mm. And all he can do is look on and watch in abject horrors, everything that he tried to, uh, to sorry, the dog's going. <laughs> <laughs> That's <all right. laughs> look on in abject horror as everything he tried to do and wanted to kind of live for 
um, and try and perfect his, his kind of, you know, expose the, the lie of foolishness that he, he actually had. So it's quite yeah. a nice ending, really, with the with the picture. Yeah, very nice. Um, if you like being trapped in portraits. Oh, I mean, when I say nice, <laughs> it's, it's not like, you know, it's, it's, it's not like we said earlier, like, it's not Solomon, you know, he it kills, uh, kills Horace and, you know, kills Fulgrim and everyone's happy and uh, gets a pat on the back from the emperor. Uh, no, yeah. it's quite it's quite rounded, but rounded in its tragic and yeah familiar story that we're getting with the the, the heresy books up to this point is that mm. you know you can get attached to the to the good guys as it were, but you know once you are attached to them, they're, they're probably not going to end in a way that you're going to you want them to end or you're going to hear from them in a while. Um, no. Whereas you know if you've got like a you can, if you can pin your hopes on someone like Lucius, maybe they'll come back round later on in the series. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess like Fulgrim's not dead, is he? And no. uh, he's there somewhere. So it leaves a door open somewhere along the line for something to happen, I guess, whether it's and happened or not. I, I, well, it, it does, um, but we'll, that we'll, we'll oh. get to that. We'll get to that because that's coming. Ah, cool. I look forward to it. Um, but I mean, Fulgrim was a fantastic book. Absolutely fantastic. I think um, the, the five that we've done now, they've all been amazing. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad I, I got to read it a second time so early, especially knowing the little bits extra that I know the second time around. Um, and I've really enjoyed sort of picking it apart as well. It's been yeah. good. It, it, it is a really, as I said, it, as part of that first, you know, opening to the to the heresy, mm. the first five books are very strong. Like, they're, yeah. they're, they're very good at getting you involved, showing you all the different sides. And the Fulgrim, as a, as a book, it introduces a lot. It pays off a lot of lore for those that, you know, have read about it or, or you know, know, know the entire story. This is this is where you know huge parts of it happen, um, and it's interesting as well because we spoke about it a couple of books ago as well. Is that like when you start these books, you think, oh, they might just be you know they're going to be about the the Primarchs, and and you read the first couple and you're like, we well, you don't really ever hear much from Horace. You do hear a little bit, but it's never yeah. about him. Um, Fulgrim's an interesting one in that although it, it takes you know picks and chooses with some of the um, some of the starters you follow this is a uh, Fulgrim story and you yeah. do see a lot of Fulgrim. So it's quite interesting to be uh, this close to a Primark for, for an extended period of time across a book. Um, yeah. So it's a good, it, it is, it is, it is a really good one. And um, as I said, it's, it's a strong start with these five books. Yeah. And we, who, who wrote that? So Graham McNeil, what else does he's, he done? He's, he, he's, he's, he's a good one. For you. Yeah, Mechanicum, yeah, I knew, and uh, I think, did he do one of the earlier ones? I think he did uh, one, yeah. False Gods as well, so, yeah, yeah. Um, he's he's a really good, really good author, um, but that adventure's over, and we look forward now, uh, we'll be doing uh, Descent of Angels, which, yeah, um, I mean, we won't poo-poo it, because it's not a bad book, it's just not... Um, full fast and furious it's, um, it's, it's definitely one that's got its uh, detractors in the community yeah. but i agree like we're not gonna we're not gonna go down that road we're just gonna treat it for what it is yeah um and 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 give it our you know the same treatment that we've done all the way through we'll have a look at yeah. it we'll, we'll, we'll go through the key points and uh, obviously talk about what it what it might mean for the yeah. uh, for the heresy as a whole yeah, it's definitely some character study, I think, as well. Uh, and it's just a d another environment, isn't it? Um, so if you don't know, it's it's pre-heresy, it's pre-primarchs uh, um, to begin with. Um, yeah. yeah, and we're going to discover the origins of uh, Lionel Johnson, who we've not heard a peep from um, or a mention of so far. No, and again, well, like all primarchs, a very important, important character in the setting. Hmm. So, um, yeah, we look forward to that. Um, thanks for joining us. And um, like we, I say all the time, like, share, subscribe, and all the stuff that we're supposed to say because we're on <laughs> YouTube and stuff. Um, but, yeah, if you, if you haven't already, please do. Um, if you want to chat about Fulgrim or the other books we've already covered, 
Um, we're both on Instagram, um, um, or you can join us on Facebook, uh, and we're all on there as well yep. um, as Iron and Ceramite. So thanks for joining us, and we'll see you on the next episode. See you later. <laughs>